first of all, Joan, uh, my friend, thank you for accepting my request to make this podcast. I am very uh, grateful to you uh, because of it. Oh, and, you're welcome. Uh, please, my pleasure. And please, uh, first of all, uh, introduce introduce yourself in short because I think uh, very much people there are very much people who are uh, not aware of who you are and what you are doing. Okay, well, my name is John Morgan, and uh, I'm a U.S. citizen, although I haven't been living in the U.S. now for, for about 14 years. Uh, I initially uh, was living in India for five years, and since then I've been uh, all over the place, but mostly in Hungary. Uh, so I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in, in Hungary, and... Uh, uh, I've been active uh, on the right since uh, about 2006, which is when, uh, with some others, I started a publishing company called Integral Tradition Publishing. Uh, that later became Arctos in 2010, uh, which some people in Hungary may have heard of. Uh, I'm not with Arctos anymore, but I'm still active in editing and writing and publishing on the right. Uh, and on social media. So, uh, yeah, I would describe myself as uh, uh, definitely not not only a conservative, because I think I'm a bit more radical in that, but uh, radical in the sense of ideas. I, I most closely identify with what we would call the new right, you know, of the French new right of Alain de Benoit, and so forth. Uh, although, I don't know. I have many different interests and beliefs that maybe don't fit into any category. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I know you as as a very uh, big expert on the works of traditional authors. Yes, I'm very interested in uh, the traditional school and uh, I've published uh, uh, many of the books of Julius Abela in English uh, when I was with Arctos. I also did one for Countercurrents. Uh, I'm, I don't know Italian, so I wasn't the translator, but I was the editor and publisher in several of them. So yes, he's very interesting to me as, as well as the other traditionalists. For me as well. Actually, this, uh, the idea of this podcast uh, uh, occurred to my mind when I first uh, heard about the terrorist attack against Daria Dugino, the daughter of uh, Dr. Alexander Dugin. I, uh, I was also I, I shocked. Uh, I was shocked by this by this attack, and uh, other and another shocking thing uh, was that I have witnessed very many comments on the internet about this uh, issue, uh, mostly liberals, but but, but uh, there were some nationalist comments also, who practically stated that uh, she got what uh, she deserved. And I strongly uh, condemned and despised these kind of uh, comments. And in that point, I felt an urge to speak up in the in this uh, issue and uh, do something with with my with my tools. And that's why I decided to to make uh, this podcast because I have uh, read your Facebook post about it and I found it uh, very very uh, inspiring. Can you remember where have you been when the moment uh, when you have heard about this uh, murder and what have you felt? Yes, well, uh, I was I was home at the time and uh, a friend of mine uh, sent me a message saying that Dari had been killed and I thought he was joking because I, I couldn't imagine any reason why that would happen. So I just wrote back and said, that's really not very funny. You shouldn't make jokes like that. But then a little bit later, uh, I checked online and uh, I saw a lot of news stories about it. And I, I thought maybe it was uh, fake news or uh, maybe being exaggerated. So I, I didn't really believe it the first few hours. I think also because I didn't want to believe it, but I stayed up uh, very late that night and, and it became obvious after some time that it actually was true. And uh, I was quite amazed uh, that this had happened. Uh, for me, I have to say it, it's something 
a bit personal as well because uh, I've known of Alexander Dugan and I've been in contact with him since the late 1990s. Uh, and I, when I was with Arctos, I was the first one to publish Dugan's books in English. Uh, the first one we did was the fourth political theory. And uh, we did several other books of Dugan's while I was there, and uh, I've known him personally. I met him once in India in uh, 2012, and we've remained in contact from time to time ever since then. I've never been uh, a part of his movement uh, or uh, you know, in any official way, and I don't even, I wouldn't quite say I consider myself a Eurasianist, although I'm, I'm interested in Eurasianism as a philosophy. Uh, but Dugan is always someone who I've considered a very interesting thinker, one of the most important uh, non-liberal thinkers. Uh, I think also crucial for understanding Russia, although his thought goes beyond only talking about Russia to more traditional themes, uh, philosophical themes and so forth, religious themes. Uh, so. When I found out that this happened, I, I have to admit I was both shocked and also angry, of course, because uh, it's still not clear if Dari was the one they intended to kill or if they were actually going for Dugan or perhaps both of them. Uh, we'll probably never know for sure, but uh, I, I just couldn't believe that uh, uh, they would have been considered uh, valid targets by any uh, reasonable uh, definition of warfare. I never met uh, Dari herself in person, although we'd been in contact before mm -hmm. by uh, social mm -hmm. media, uh, and many of my friends knew her personally. So it was it was quite a shocking blow, and uh, yeah, I was uh, quite angry and saddened uh, by this. Uh, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, some people I knew on social media were posting things like, oh, you know, now we should flatten Ukraine or whatever. And I I tried to make it clear that uh, in my responses that I don't think we should try to blame the Ukrainian people because, you know, it's not a decision that was taken by the nation. We don't know who was behind it. It may not have even been the Ukrainian government. It might have been uh, Azov or one of these other nationalist groups or who mm -hmm. knows, many possibilities and we'll probably never know for sure. But uh, yeah, I, I tried to see it as uh, something motivating that she was very hardworking, uh, very dedicated to her father's cause. I think uh, Dr. Dugan is extremely fortunate that he had a daughter like her uh, who did everything she could to support his work. Uh, I have a friend uh, who uh, years ago uh, we were sitting having a beer on a Friday night and uh, the subject of Dari came up and uh, he was telling me what she was like. Uh, and he said, she's not somewhere having a beer right now. She's somewhere doing work for her father's cause. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, she was a real political soldier, we could say. And the role so, model for, for activists, political activists. Yes. So I try to see, given the tragic uh, fact of her death, that we should just try to see it as an inspiration to ourselves to uh, be as dedicated and hardworking as she was. Uh, now, about those people who say she deserved it, well, uh, it certainly is true that uh, she supported the Russian war effort, but in that sense, she's not different from most Russians. Yeah, uh, and then practically she did journalism. She did not carry a weapon or something. So, those no, who, no, yeah. cer certainly not. She was never in the the Russian military. Uh, so. It, it just depends, I guess, on what you think the limits of warfare should be. But if we say that she was a legitimate target, that basically means that anybody who uh, yeah. takes a political yeah. stance that you don't like is therefore a legitimate target. I, I don't know if this was the case in Hungarian, but in the English speaking world, uh, people were claiming that she had said that the Ukrainians should be wiped out, you know, should all be killed. but. Uh, but uh, as, far as, in, uh -huh. as far as I know, go and see what she said, uh, yeah. she was only referring to 
uh, people who she considered responsible for uh, you know, Ukraine fighting this war. Uh, she wasn't talking about Ukrainians in general. A similar thing happened with her father years ago. A comment that he made uh, about Ukrainians was misunderstood. So I, I certainly don't think she's a legitimate target. Absolutely. Uh, I Absolutely. mean, if that's the case, like uh, you know, in Ukraine, Olena Semenyaka is uh, uh, sort of like an intellectual mouthpiece for the Ukrainian nationalists, but she's not in the army. You know, I, I wouldn't approve of somebody targeting her. Uh, so, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I think it's uh, in, in my case, I don't think it was uh, something we can say it was justified. If we are, we're opening the door for all sorts of uh, terrorism and uh, uh, murder. Yeah, and the strange thing is that uh, those who usually preach about peace and love and uh, tolerance and uh, and despise uh, the chauvinist hatred uh, that people the that people commented like that mm -hmm. so so they so they uh, practically supported the uh, uh, total war let's say and this is uh, once uh, once more they proved the, the fact that uh, liberals have a tendency not to be consequent Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, that's the irony of, of people who talk about peace and love all the time is they they believe in peace and love as long as everyone agrees with them about everything. Yeah, yeah. And if they don't, <laughs> yeah, they yeah, think absolutely. they should be destroyed. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this is basically the basis of all of U.S. foreign policy, you know, because in in the mind of Washington and the globalists, uh, they're all, all they want is uh, peace and justice and freedom for the whole world, but they yeah. have to first destroy all the people who. Uh, <laughs> who this is the agree exporting the democracy. Democracy yeah. export is like that. Yeah. Yes. True. <laughs> and you you mentioned something in in this uh, Facebook post, uh, as far as I remember, you said that uh, you should have been wiser before because you did some certain uh, so you refer to something that uh, you criticized or have not believed uh, Dugin in certain aspects uh, let me cite it uh, accurately everything that has happened since shows he was obviously correct about everything he has been saying about the situation and I should have been wiser at the time. What uh, what uh, were you referring to? Can you remember? Oh, yes, absolutely. Well, I've, I've been in touch with uh, Dr. Dugan since the 1990s when uh, his very first website was called Arctogaia in English. I think it's still up. And uh, I had no idea who he was. You know, he was totally unknown in the U.S. at that time. But uh, I found his website very interesting. Uh, I think it was either I think he created it when it, it was near the end of his period as a national Bolshevik. He, he left that movement not long after uh, uh, Arctogaia was set up. But I found it very interesting. And I, that was when I first got in, in contact with him and, and his group. Uh, and for many years after that, I, I always found him interesting and I'd published him through Arctos. But when the Maidan happened uh, in late 2013 and early 2014, uh, I'd been in contact with some of the people who are now very prominent among the Ukrainian nationalists because they, some of them were also interested in tradition and Avila and these things. Uh, and they, um, were admirers of Arctos and read our books and things. So I, uh, of course, at that time, the, although everyone knew about the tensions there, there was no actual conflict between Russia yeah. and Ukraine. I'm talking about the early 2010s. So when the Maidan happened, I talked to some of these people and they, they told me about, uh, in Ukraine, I mean, about what they see as what's going on uh, and what they were fighting for. And... Uh, I also, of course, was following what Dr. Dugan was saying about it. And I would never say that I I disagreed with him. 
but I felt like, well, let's give the Ukrainian nationalists a chance because what they told me in 2014 was that they wanted a Ukraine that was not aligned with Russia or with NATO and the US and the EU, but uh, you know this sort of third position that would be more conservative and traditional and that they would uh, try to create this intermarium alliance that's a very important component mm -hmm. of their ideology mm -hmm. uh, that they hoped would include a lot of uh, you know, the Baltic states and, and Central and Eastern Europe, maybe even into Central Asia. Uh, but of course, they, they were hoping, uh, thinking long term, that Hungary would be interested in joining this. And it sounded like an interesting idea. Uh, even then, I was a bit skeptical that they could make it happen. Uh, but I thought it was at least worth giving them a chance. So I uh, basically remained neutral at that time. Uh, I, I never uh, made any declaration of support for them or anything, but uh, I tried to keep an open mind about them. And that was true for a while after that. But mm -hmm. uh, as the years went by, you know, all I saw was the Ukrainian nationalists acting more and more as the foot soldiers for uh, the U.S. and for NATO. Uh, and then finally, when th it finally turned into the conflict uh, earlier this year, uh, these same people who I talked to were talking about how great Zelensky is, the great leader Zelensky, and how really? the Ukraine even nationalists. To... Even yes, nationalists. I mean, I'm, I'm going by their public statements. This isn't <laughs> anything only I know about and how, you know, now uh, uh, Ukraine's going to end up in the EU and NATO and they'll become, you know, great force within NATO. So uh, when I took a stand, uh, uh, on my social media, more in uh, support of the Russian point of view. They, of course, were quite angry with me, but I just told them, I said, I don't see that you are doing anything uh, towards realizing this third position. I think uh, they're just being used by the uh, yeah. uh, by the West. Uh, I mean, I think that they had eight years to uh, try to establish this this third force in Ukraine. But if you look at the election results, even the both of the post Maidan elections, uh, uh, the 2014 and I think it was 2019, the second one, mm -hmm. uh, the radical right parties all scored like less than five percent combined. So that mm -hmm. doesn't suggest to me that they have a lot of uh, support within Ukraine itself, but they still have a lot of influence, of course, because they provide the muscle for uh, uh, yeah. for the regime and for NATO. So that gives them an outsized influence on what's going on there. Yeah, and they are uh, sacrificed practically in the in the battlefield. Yeah, I mean, I when I in 2014 when I I was speaking to a Croatian friend of mine, yeah. and. Uh, he was actually more skeptical than I was because I said, well, I think we should give these people a chance. Uh, and he said, well, this just reminds me of Croatia in the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember this. I'm old enough that I remember that in the 90s uh, on the, the right in the U.S., some people were saying that uh, it was going to be great because the Croatian nationalists were gaining all this uh, combat experience and weapons and so forth, and that when the war was over, you know, they were going to take over Croatia and turn it into this, uh, uh, you know, radical right-wing state. But that's not what happened. I mean, as we can see, I mean, today Croatia's government uh, uh, isn't even as right-wing as Orban. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's just mm -hmm. uh, maybe yeah. vaguely conservative in some ways, but uh, that didn't materialize. And I think it will be the same with Ukraine. Uh, whichever way this war ends, sooner or later, uh, I, they're going to be indebted to the U.S. and the EU and NATO uh, for the next 50 years, at least. Uh, I don't believe they're going to have the freedom of action to realize a... Uh, uh, some kind of a third position uh, uh, that's yeah. not aligned with, with the West. I, I believe that maybe at first they'll have, again, a vaguely conservative government, 
Uh, and if they manage to get into the EU, maybe they'll do things like vote with Hungary and Poland on uh, anti LGBTQ stuff once in a while in the European Parliament. But I don't think it's going to be anything more than that. And I think the the globalists, they'll see this and they'll think, fine, you know, we'll let them, uh, you know, we'll let them do these things for now because uh, uh, we're uh, brainwashing their children with uh, the media and uh, the internet and so forth. And in uh, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, their kids will be uh, completely liberalized, just like, you know, what they're doing in, in Eastern Europe now. Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I think that, yeah, it, it would just be uh, some kind of vague kind of shallow conservatism that probably wouldn't even last very long. So, And Dugin, uh, Dugin uh, said it uh, in advance, so, so he predicted it. Yeah, I mean, he ironic. I mean, he basically what he wanted in 2014 is what Putin did this year. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was already saying in 2014 that uh, uh, Ukraine was vital for Russian security, that Putin ought to send the army in and go all the way to, to Kiev. Uh, I think maybe if they'd done it, then they might have actually succeeded. Uh, but uh, yeah. much more easily than than now. But uh, uh, he also addressed. I mean, he knew about the the Ukrainian nationalists because, like, one of them, Olena Semenyaka, who was a spokesman for right sector, and then later mm -hmm. uh, uh, for Azov, and now she's uh, uh, involved in this Intermarium Alliance. I think it's called. That's in the Ukrainian Parliament. Uh, she used to be uh, friendly with Dugin and even attended one of his conferences in Russia. Uh, there's photos online that show this. So uh, he knew very well uh, about their positions, uh, but he just said that there's no way that Ukraine doesn't have the option to not go with the West or with Russia. They have mm -hmm. to go with one or the other. That's just the geopolitical reality. And he said, uh, but if they align with Russia, Russia would actually act as a guarantor for uh, their ethnicity better mm -hmm. than the West would, which, you know, as mm -hmm. we can see in, in Europe today, I mean, the yeah. Western influence and liberalism are horribly corrosive. They destroy every culture sooner or later. We can debate about how effective Russia would have been at that, but I certainly can't see how it would have been worse than the West will be for Ukraine. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, he but he also pointed out, I remember in 2014 that, well, if uh, if these guys are, you know, the Ukrainian nationalists are really serious about what they're saying, you know, the government was tied up at that. The Ukrainian government was tied up in uh, fighting the separatists in the east. Uh, he said they could easily have a coup and take over uh, and impose their own government. Uh, and he said mm -hmm. the fact that they didn't do that and went to the east to fight the separatists instead, he said was the proof that they didn't really believe what they were saying. Uh, maybe he was right about that. So it, looking back, I, I, you know, since I have so much respect for him in other ways, I probably should have just accepted his greater wisdom uh, in this matter because uh, uh, it was a bit embarrassing for me that I ever said anything positive about, uh, about these people who've uh, created this war, but... Uh, Oh, there it is. Uh, you 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 gain experience as you get older. But uh, yeah, I I still find uh, Dr. Dugan extremely interesting, and uh, uh, I think he's it's very important for people interested in the true right to to uh, uh, yeah study his work. Yeah, and what is your opinion uh, about the labels uh, which are usually dedicated to Dr. Dugin, such as? Uh, Putin's brain, the mastermind behind Putin, ultranationalist, high rightist, fascist, communist. So, <laughs> as I yeah, see, well, almost almost all labels are are dedicated to him. Uh, how do you see uh, which one is true, or 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 none of none of them is true? And what are the key elements? Uh, what are the main statements of his ideology? Oh, none of those are, are true. Uh, he's, you can read even just a few pages of any of his works and you can see that he's not a fascist or a communist, but he draws on 
both of those. Uh, he has this concept of what he calls the fourth political theory. Uh, the first theory is liberalism, because it's the oldest. The second was uh, communism, and the third was fascism. And he says, we need a fourth political theory that will overcome uh, the dominance of liberalism in the world. But to do that, we need to draw elements from the first three political theories, but develop something new that will go beyond them. Uh, so he's, you'll find references to communist and fascist thinkers in his work quite often, but uh, uh, including Heidegger, of course, who was a national socialist. Uh, uh, and he acknowledges that they were valid attempts to overcome liberalism, but he he thinks it's not possible to return to those uh, earlier ideologies. Well, in terms of communism, uh, he I, I think a lot of people think just because he's Russian and because of his earlier involvement with national Bolshevism that uh, He's uh, uh, a communist, but he's very clear in his work. There's one called uh, The Last War of the World Island is the English mm -hmm, title. Mm -hmm. I think the original Russian title is uh, The Geopolitics of Contemporary Russia. But he offers a history of Russian geopolitics over the last 100 years or so. And it's quite clear in this book that uh, he rejects communism absolutely because it's uh, an atheistic ideology. And of course, he's a, a very devout uh, Orthodox Christian. Uh, and because it's uh, international and uh, materialistic, uh, he rejects it, although he is of the school and he's not the first to assert this, but that uh, Stalin ended up sort of reforming communism into something more national, we could almost say national socialist mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in Russia. But even there, he, he makes it clear if, if you read his statements on this topic that he's not a Stalinist either. But as a Russian, of course, like many Russians do, he admires uh, the fact that Stalin brought Russia to uh, uh, empirehood or such, yeah. yeah, such a such a great uh, empire. So uh, uh, in that sense, uh, he uh, is somewhat positive, but uh, he has he's never advocated for a return to communism or a return to Stalinism or any of these things, uh, nor has he ever uh, called for Russia to reoccupy all the Warsaw Pact countries. Uh, I mean, he's been very clear on this. Ukraine is a different case because he considers that part of Russia's uh, sphere. But uh, he acknowledges that Europe would be, uh, you know, is a separate geopolitical block, and he's not looking for Russia to reabsorb parts of Europe. Uh, although he also, of course, believes, uh, and again, he's not the first to say this, that uh, uh, the best future for Europe, if it wants to escape from globalism and liberalism, is for Europe and Russia to enter into an alliance again. Uh, which is, of course, a concept that goes back to the 19th century, the idea that uh, uh, Berlin and Moscow aligned would uh, be capable of uh, uh, breaking the Anglo-Saxon domination of the world. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, he's, he's not a communist, uh, definitely not a fascist. Uh, what are some of the other labels that you mentioned? Uh, uh, nationalist, well, I mean... In a sense, I would say Dugan supports nationalism, but I would say he does in the way people like we do, where, well, the, the nation state is what we have to work with, so uh, we, yeah. you know, we, we should support it. But uh, uh, he's more of an imperialist, of course, because he sees Russia as an empire. Uh, of course, the empire is a more traditional form. The nation state is a modern liberal concept. Uh, I mean, of course, that's what destroyed the, the Austro-Hungarian Empire, was liberalism and uh, ethno-nationalism. And uh, we see again today in Ukraine, they're using uh, ethno-nationalism again to try to uh, destroy Russia as an imperial entity. So it's the yeah. same game they've been playing for uh, well over 100 years now. Uh, so, but to get back to Dugin, yes, he's, he's more of an uh, imperialist, I would say, not... Uh, a nationalist. 
And uh, you also mentioned this idea that he's Putin's brain. But what yeah. I always what I always tell Putin's people, Rasputin, Putin's Rasputin, and and these these labels are usually right. It's okay. it's not a simple question. What I always say is that uh, Dugan is not as important as his enemies say, but he's also not as insignificant as, yeah, as yeah. other critics say. Uh, it's somewhere in between. Uh, I mean, he's clearly connected to the Kremlin and the Russian establishment. So you know, he, he makes many trips to you know, Iran, uh, uh, Lebanon, you know, Muslim countries, to India, which is where I met him. Uh, and you can tell it's he's sort of like an unofficial ambassador for mm -hmm. the Kremlin, I would say. You could a soft power. Uh, so I think he is connected to the establishment. And uh, when I asked him about this myself, when when we met, he said that, well, uh, in the Russian establishment, uh, people are not interested in his the more traditional or esoteric aspects of his ideas. But the geopolitics uh, is interesting to many people in the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. And in the 1990s, uh, when during the Yeltsin period, when Russia was basically shattered and on its knees and doing whatever the West said, basically, uh, Dugan was one of the only people, maybe the only person, although I, I want to verify that before making that claim, who was calling for uh, the restoration of Russia as a great power and that Russia should reassert its role as an adversary of the, the liberal West. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and he wrote a book uh, that's never been translated, but it's uh, uh, Foundations of Geopolitics, and that's been verified that that was actually used by the uh, uh, Russian uh, uh, military academies at the time. I don't think it still is because it's quite old now, but uh, so he definitely had influence and he's had uh, some positions uh, with political parties in Russia, including the, the new Communist Party in the early 2000s, uh, but those those involvements usually didn't last long. Uh, so. He yeah, he is part of the you could say the circle of the Kremlin on the outer mm -hmm. rings, although I think uh, in 2014 he was saying, well, now they would seem perfectly in line with what the uh, what the Kremlin is saying today. But in 2014, yeah. the things he was saying about that the Russian army should go to Kiev, and yeah. uh, that was right, quite radical. And then he uh, uh, on VK, which is like the Russian Facebook, uh, he had a post where there was a, a line. He said something like genocide against the Cretans is in order. And this was publicized that he was calling for the genocide of the Ukrainians. But he says when when I've asked him about this, that he was only talking about uh, the people who were responsible for the fire at the trade union house in Odessa yeah. in May yeah. 2014, where about 50 ethnic Russians were burned to death. Uh, he said he was referring to those people. But even in Russia, this became a big scandal and he had been the head of the uh, sociology department at Moscow mm -hmm. State University, and uh, he was dismissed from his position. Uh, and uh, uh, from what I've been told by people who know about such things, that wouldn't have happened without the Kremlin's involvement. So I think that was sort of the Kremlin signaling that, well, he doesn't speak for us. Yeah. Uh, I see. So maybe his involvement these days is less than it was, but still, uh, if you look at what Putin has been doing uh, in recent years, or actually even going back to the 2000s, he clearly uses language that's derived from Dugin. Uh, I mean, Dugin's uh, philosophy is Eurasianism, his political philosophy, and uh, uh, Putin draws on many of the concepts that Dugin has been writing about for the last 20 years in his speeches. And that's not only recently, he's been doing that for many years. Uh, I don't think that means that 
Dugan and Putin are meeting <laughs> and that Putin yeah, is yeah, yeah. You know, taking orders from him, but he's clearly familiar with these ideas and is interested in them. Yeah, yeah. So so the situation is not like that uh, uh, Dugin is whispering in the ears of, of Vladimir Putin, but uh, I think uh, Putin uh, has to adopt some kind of ideology uh, because of pragmatic reasons, because uh, uh, he needs something to show up against the liberal West. Uh, mm -hmm. it, it cannot go that way, what the Russian constitution said, that they cannot have an ideology. I think it's uh, quite of uh, nonsense, because otherwise we cannot uh, tell what we are doing in politics without an ideology. So definitely I think Putin needs uh, some kind of ideology uh, which is which can be counterpart of the liberal West. Well, for many years it's been known that uh, he's an avid reader and he actually uh, requires members of his cabinet to read certain books that he assigns and uh, uh, Dugan is not one of them actually, but uh, he, he uses like Ivan Ilin, mm -hmm. who's a uh, uh, Russian radical anti-liberal thinker of the 20th century and uh, Nicholas Berdaev, uh, who was uh, sort of an orthodox kind of existential conservative. Uh, uh, so he's definitely drawing on uh, philosophical sources in what he wants to do. Um, when it comes to Putin himself, uh, Dugan wrote an entire book called uh, Putin versus Putin. And the meaning of the title is that he says there are two Putins. Uh, he calls them the lunar and the solar Putin. And he hmm. says that the, the lunar Putin is the one who wants to continue doing like what Yeltsin was doing, like liberalizing Russia, westernizing it, increasing globalization, increasing cooperation with the West. And that there is the solar Putin, who is uh, more authentically Russian, wants to see Russia as a, a pillar of this multipolar world that's no longer dominated by the United States, uh, but a world that's dominated by several great powers of which Russia would be one. Uh, Putin, who's anti-liberal and so on. Uh, and he claims that when you follow Putin's career, uh, he he goes back and forth between these two positions. Uh, so he says that you know he he hopes that Putin will eventually you know just become the solar Putin. <laughs> mm -hmm. I and see. After 2014, after those initial months of the conflict, uh, Dugin stopped saying anything publicly about Ukraine for the most part, uh, almost nothing. And it wasn't until February this year when the, the special military operation began that uh, 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 that he uh, started to talk about the situation again. Yeah. And he said that now it seems clear that Putin has uh, uh, chosen the, the solar Putin. <laughs> He's mm -hmm. become the solar Putin. Uh, only time will tell if that's really true, but certainly uh, if you look at the decisions that Putin has made now, that's basically isolated him from the West. Uh, we don't know where this will end up, but it might be possible that he's really trying to uh, establish Russia as a real anti-liberal force. I mean, he was talking about this again in his speech on Friday. So if, if you want to understand the sort of mentality that Putin operates in, whether regardless of whether... He's actually, uh, you know, Dugan is his advisor or not. Uh, reading Dugan, you will understand that position much better because yeah, yeah. whether Dugan is Putin's advisor or not, everything that Putin has been doing, uh, ever, you know, for the last twenty years, has been what uh, Dugan has been calling for. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah, in that sense, I don't even know if it matters if it's. Uh, if he's his advisor or not, because it, it still will tell you what Russia is trying to do right now. Yeah, and uh, you mentioned one point, which is a crucial point of uh, the ideology of Dugin. It is the unipolarity versus the multipolarity. 
Yes. And uh, practically Dugin says that uh, unipolarity is represented by the USA and its allies or vassals. And, uh, and the multipolarity can be expressed by, by Russia or Russia can be one other pole, maybe the second uh, pole besides uh, USA. And, and uh, by this second pole, much more poles can appear. How do you see it? Is it some kind of uh, rhetoric or political communication or, or does he mean, mean it? Isn't Dugin an advocate of uh, a unipolar Russian empire or, or we can believe this multipolarity concept? No, if you read Dugin's work, multipolarity is fundamental to his worldview. Uh, and that relates to tradition as well. Uh, he's, he's makes it quite clear in his work that he's not looking for a world dominated by Russia, which, as even he says, is not possible anyway. Russia isn't strong enough to achieve that on its own. Uh, or even a bipolar world, you know, like during the Cold War, where it's Russia versus the U.S. Uh, he envisions... Uh, a series of five or six or maybe even more powers like Brazil, India, China, Iran, uh, that would uh, exist in sort of a network, but they would be able to keep each other in check to keep any one power from uh, becoming completely dominant like the U.S. has been now. Uh, well, I mean, the U.S.'s influence has been tremendous since the Second World War, but uh, of course, since the Soviet Union declined, it's been the only superpower. And uh, Dugan says, and I also agree, I don't think this has been good for the world uh, because American culture is extremely destructive. Uh, the, the principles that underlie present day American culture uh, are completely nihilistic. So. Uh, the multipolar world relates to tradition because as Dugan understands it, if we have these power blocks, they would be uh, like whatever the most powerful nation in the like in the Russian block and the Chinese block, uh, et cetera, et cetera. That country would be responsible for uh, looking after the needs of the various other peoples and ethnicities within its sphere. Mm -hmm. So this relates to tradition, of course, because if, if we end up with uh, uh, a neoliberal world order that's dominated by Washington and Brussels ideas, their type of ideas, uh, that's going to be the, the end of all traditional culture, the end of all uh, uh, traditions, all unique cultures, I would say. Yeah. In, it would take a while, but I think we will get there. And certainly that's the way things are moving. So he thinks a multipolar world order would help to preserve the traditions of the various traditions of the world against being uh, overwhelmed by, we could call it Americanism. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So that, that's, that's uh, yeah, that's his idea of multipolarity. But he does think that Russia should be one of them. And of course it can be, it's a nuclear power after all. So there's not uh, many of those. So it, it certainly, uh, even though its economic situation is not as strong as uh, some of the other powers, uh, that, that gives it uh, quite a bit of clout. Well, yeah. Uh, I have a quote from the fourth uh, political theory. I read it. American values pretend to be universal ones. In reality, it is a new form of ideological aggression against the multiplicity of cultures and traditions still existing in the rest of the world. Therefore, all traditionalists should be against the West and globalization, as well as against the imperialist politics of the United States. This is a, a quote from the fourth political theory. Uh, do you, can you agree with it uh, as a person who has an American uh, origin as well? Uh, doesn't have America and USA another face, only liberal face it has and globalist face uh, it possesses. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I, I was the one who published and edited the fourth political theory, by the way. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, um, I think as an American, I 
am in a unique position to see why it's so destructive. Uh, foreigners who meet me are often surprised at how opposed to America today that I am. Uh, but I, I feel that way because I see what the end result of it is. Uh, I, I don't think many people who have never been there or spent significant time there really know what it's like. Uh, but it's not something that any right wing person, certainly, or traditional person uh, should be defending or advocating for. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, it's unfortunate this is the case. I understand that there's more issues at stake, but the fact is, in the end, this current war uh, is between the US and Russia. Ukraine is just the, the pawn that's being yeah. used. But uh, yeah, I, 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 this is a contradiction that I think maybe some nationalists from other countries don't understand is that if you're an American who wants to be on the true right, you know, I'm using a term from Ava the yeah. Ava called the true right, uh, that which doesn't uh, follow the ideals of the French Revolution. So not the conservative right, which is based in liberalism, yeah. but the, the true right. This uh, is a reference point for myself. Yes. Also. <laughs> yeah. Yes. yes. Uh, if you adhere to the true right, uh, the fact is that as an American, you have to be opposed to America as it was con as it's constituted today. There's there's no escaping it. So yeah. uh, even though there were certain positive things about Trump and about uh, populism in the US. I don't want to make America great again in the sense that uh, I want America to become, uh, a, uh, well, it is a superpower, we'd have to say, but continue as a superpower or become an even greater superpower. Uh, I think America needs to be limited. It needs to be weaker. Uh, or the world's going to be in big trouble. I mean, we, we see that all the time. I don't even think a lot of Hungarians realize, uh, uh, I mean, in, in the US, when they want to talk about, you know, the evil countries of the world today, Hungary is one of them. <laughs> uh, in our popular media and so forth, uh, they see Hungary the exact same way as Russia. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you have told me that uh, we Hungarians cannot imagine how much extent uh, we are labeled as something evil. Yeah, and that's most Americans don't know much about the rest of the world. So they hear this in the popular media and they just go along with it. I mean, when I when I talk to even some of my own relatives back in the US who haven't traveled a lot, uh, they envision that I'm living in like like how you would think Moscow was in, in you know, 1930 or something like that. Because <laughs> they, they uh, yeah, they just see Hungary as like a backwards uh, reactionary country and uh, uh, whose people are oppressed and, you know, it needs to be liberated by Western liberal values. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, that Orban's a dictator and, uh, yeah, all these kinds of things. So that that's just one aspect. I mean, the US, that is what it does. It acts as the instrument of destroying all conservative and traditional culture everywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, that's its mission. So uh, and Democrats and, and uh, Republicans only maybe a different level, but the same agenda. Yeah, I mean, we're seeing some weak signs that the Republican Party is improving. I mean, certainly since Trump, they've gotten uh, a more a bit more sensible. Uh, for example, I mean, a lot of conservatives and Republicans in the US now are uh, uh, ambivalent about the war or even maybe even slightly tilted towards Russia uh, mm -hmm. on these things that would have been impossible even 10 years ago in the mm -hmm. US. So things are changing. But there is an, I think, an authentic America that you can find if you go back to the 19th century and you want to read the great American writers of that time, like Emerson and Herman Melville uh, and so forth. Uh, you'll see uh, there was a different America, but that's been completely drowned out now by this uh, neoliberal globalist shit. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, that's the irony for us is the first victim of the American unipolar world order is ordinary, especially white Americans. Uh, yeah. We are the, the main victim. 
So I think it's even in ordinary Americans' interests to uh, try to fight it. And Dugan has made this point. There's a, a short essay of his from years ago where he says, uh, Alexander Dugan, enemy of the United States, friend of the American people. <laughs> and I think, yeah, that's yeah. what he's getting at. This is so, because you know, the revolution devours its children. Yes. Yeah, you could say so. But I mean, this isn't even a revolution that the American people chose. It was just something that developed gradually over time. Uh, that's a whole other subject about how the U.S. ended up the way it is now. But uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, you could say. But it's it's not of benefit to ordinary Americans for this situation to continue either. The only people who it benefits are uh, uh, the rich and, and powerful, and they're the ones who uh, uh, are our biggest enemies because they want to destroy all uh, all conservative and traditional culture everywhere. Dugin states that the root cause of the problem is individualism, and uh, and he promotes a certain anti-individual anti-individualism for this problem. Uh, how can we grasp uh, this idea? Well, liberalism, as it's developed from ideas that were first posed in England and Scotland and uh, France. Uh, have developed into uh, enshrining the individual as God. Uh, yeah. I mean, of course, before the French and American revolutions, uh, God was always at the, the center of any political system, not only in, in Europe, but everywhere in the world. Uh, so liberalism displaces that with the individual. Uh, the problem is when you do that, of course, you're talking about an entity that doesn't even really exist because an individual only has meaning within as being part of a community, yeah. uh, an ethnic community, a linguistic community, a religious community, and so forth. So to posit uh, an individual uh, isn't even an accurate understanding of humanity because uh, a, a person who theoretically exists independently of all communities uh, would be like, uh, you know, some kind of a savage animal. I mean, you, <laughs> you can, there yeah. is no such thing. And you only have rights as I mean, nobody is born with rights. This is a very strange idea, the concept of human rights. You gain rights by participating in your community and by performing duties. Yeah. Uh, so... The problem with liberalism is that it's based on this false idea of the individual. And uh, I don't even think the people who first formulated it would have imagined where we are today, where now in the U.S. Yeah. we have people saying that uh, the individual should have a right to choose his or her gender or sexuality yeah. or. Uh, yeah, it's it's now we see what the end result of this philosophy. Uh, but of course, this is great for. Uh, the, the globalists, because uh, when they only have a collection of individuals, uh, you can sell them all sorts of products to uh, 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 so that they can uh, identify themselves. I mean, it's, it's a joke in the U.S. that now uh, yeah. uh, your identity is uh, whatever you wear on your T-shirt, uh, yeah. because as an American, that doesn't really have a whole lot more meaning than that at this point. So I think uh, the globalists are quite happy at this state of affairs. Uh, so, yeah, I think that's that's what Dugan is getting at with this idea. Uh, and that's, maybe... This is where Hungary is strong compared to the U.S., because what struck me in Hungary is that uh, even uh, the liberals who I've met here uh, they still are aware of their Hungarian identity. They see themselves as part of the Hungarian community, even if they might disagree politically with certain things mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. They still see themselves as Hungarian, which was really uh, uh, something new for me because these days in America, being an American doesn't really mean a whole lot to most people. Mm -hmm. uh, most people are just caught up in trying to get rich uh, or well, yeah, <laughs> the things yeah. that they own, not so much uh, that they're not thinking about their people or you know their place in the community or anything like that. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, as I interpreted uh, the words of Dugin to myself, as um, the identity uh, can be a freedom, freedom of someone, live by certain identity. So, ne so not just the co community, but uh, if I if I live by certain religious uh, practices, or or I am loyal to my nation, this is also a freedom of someone. Yes, we, it's we a different kind of freedom. Neglects. Yeah. It's a way of realizing yourself. Yes, uh, yes. I mean, in, in liberalism, the idea of self-realization is that you have an infinite number of choices. But we could use an analogy that if you go to the supermarket and they have 20 different kinds of uh, mustard. Yeah. Uh, okay, you, you have more freedom because you have uh, 20 yeah. different uh, kinds of mustard to choose from, but it's all just mustard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The true self-realization is about realizing yourself, yourself in relation to others and in relation to God. That's yes. real self-realization, understanding yourself, your, your deepest self. Yes. Uh, so, yeah, this is, uh, I think this is where Dugan is going with this idea. By the way, I see a flag behind you. I think in the beginning we, we did not say anything about it. <laughs> what, what is it? Well, this is the, the Transylvanian flag, uh, because my, uh, my mother's family were, uh, Erdesas. They were mm -hmm. Transylvania Saxon. So, uh, yeah, I just thought it was appropriate. Uh, another uh, positive outcome of, of empire, you could say, when yeah, yeah, <laughs> when, when, when Germans and Hungarians and Romanians uh, uh, work together in Transylvania, as yeah, they did yeah. for many centuries. Yes, uh, yes. But now, uh, I mean, I know everything was not always perfect, but uh, <laughs> better than yeah. the situation we have today. Where the Saxons yeah. aren't even there anymore. That's, uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, getting back to Dugin, uh, he participated in a so-called National Bolshevik Party. Yes. Uh, National Bolshevik sounds uh, honestly very bad to me. What was this uh, about, and how should we uh, judge it? Well, I don't know as much about that part of Dugan's life because almost all of his work that's been translated so far uh, has been from his later Eurasianist period. Uh, but, uh, you know, he was still very young then and there, there weren't uh, many alternatives in Russia in the 1990s. But I, I think uh, for me as, uh, uh, you know, I, I think of myself as somebody who adheres to the true right but when we look at the political spectrum today, we find elements of the true right on both the left and the right. Uh, so I think we have to look at both. And I, I, national Bolshevism, which also existed in Germany in the 1920s and 30s, uh, as well as among the Russian uh, expatriates, the, the white Russians uh, at that time. Uh, sought to combine elements of communism, like the concern for the working class and so forth, with a national point of view. Mm -hmm. So not international Bolshevism and not uh, uh, not with all of the uh, 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 nihilism and materialism and the, the anti-religious aspect of, of Bolshevism, mm -hmm. with that removed, but with the mm -hmm. more socialist part combined with radical nationalism. That was sort of the idea of it. But uh, the, Dugan was not the head of that party. It was a, a man named Eduard Limanov. Uh, and from what I've read, from what Dugan has said about him, he was more of like a, like a punk uh, kind of prankster guy. And mm -hmm. I, I think he just enjoyed uh, like being a rebel and being very extreme, yeah. but uh, he wasn't very serious about the ideas or about the ideology. Uh, and that's why Dugan eventually left him. So, uh, yeah, I can understand why uh, 
in in Hungary today it can seem like a, a, a strange thing and a, maybe a troubling thing, but uh, Dugan hasn't identified as a national Bolshevik for about 25 years now, so it's uh, something in his past. And anyway, I mean, uh, uh, we can't really say in in the first years after the collapse of communism that it would be surprising that people would try to draw on the communist legacy because you know, it was something that was still uh, 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 a part of people's reality in Russia. So I don't see it as uh, okay, that surprising. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I, I, even he uh, says that he didn't think that the, the party really amounted to much. And they, yeah, I, see. I think and they're still around, but... Uh, Mm -hmm. and, and on the other hand, uh, if we are speaking uh, on behalf of the true right, then uh, I have learned from my books, my traditional uh, books, that uh, no compromise ever pays off if we are speaking of principles. And, and that's why uh, that is the other cause for which this national Bolshevism sounds very badly to me. Well, that's true, but if we as people who adhere to tradition get involved in politics at all, it's always going to be a compromise. Yeah, yeah, that's because true. Because the true. only true form of politics in a traditional state is a monarchy supported by the church. Uh, and I don't think that you would disagree with me that that's impossible to achieve anywhere in the West today. Yeah, otherwise we have to invent the fourth political practice. <laughs> yes, well, I mean, Dugan himself is, of course, uh, a monarchist, ultimately. He just sees it as something that's not achievable in Russia. Uh, Dugan is, one reason I admire him is because he's, perhaps the only thinker I can think of who's tried to combine tradition in the Evolian Genonian sense with politics. Uh, and most of the traditionalists in the, in the US hate him uh, because of this, uh, not the political ones, but I'm talking mm -hmm. about the more uh, uh, esoteric intellectual ones. Uh, and there's an interview once where Dugan was asked about this, and he actually said, well, quite frankly, I hate traditionalists because uh, he said a, a real tra uh, traditionalist for me tries to do something, tries to do something in the world and doesn't just sit there and uh, uh, comment. I mean, uh, in the U.S., we have people who uh, follow the ideas of Genon and Shuon, for example. Mm -hmm. But uh, generally, what they do is uh, uh, they convert to Islam in most cases, mm -hmm. and then they go into academia. You know, they become professors or lecturers, and then mm -hmm. they spend their lives writing books and articles about uh, obscure aspects of uh, Islamic esotericism and mm -hmm. such things. I see. I see. And I mean, this is uh, there's which is useful, value. but it, it's not politics. It's useful, but it's not politics. Well, I think many of these people would argue that, well, in uh, in this age, in Kali Yuga, there isn't any genuine political system that's traditional that we could develop. So it's better to just not get involved. Yeah, and leave it, uh, leave it alone. I see. But I think for people like us, uh, I would still rather try to at least influence the world and society in that direction, even if we can't get there 100%, uh, at least we can improve things from how they are now, where, I mean, things are absolutely awful. So anything we can do is an improvement on this. And I think this is Dugan's perspective as well. Uh, I mean, I don't think in my lifetime we're going to see uh, uh, any uh, traditional monarchy uh, arising in the West, but uh, it's at least a goal yeah. that we should have and we have to work with uh, what we have in the meantime. I remember a conversation I had many years ago with uh, uh, Tibor Barani, uh, who's the Hungarian traditionalist, and it was when he was still working with Jobbik. And uh, I said, well, how do you reconcile uh, being a traditionalist and also working with a political party? 
And he told me that he realized that was a contradiction, but uh, he said, I still think we can do some good in Hungary for perhaps the next 40 years, I think was the number he used. And he said, after that, Kali Yugo will be so advanced, you know, we can't do anything, but we can at least make things better in Hungary until then. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I think this is also Dugan's perspective on these things. So, uh, yes, today, today I reread uh, one chapter from this book. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. The fourth political uh, practice. There is there is a chapter with this name. And uh, Dugin uh, writes uh, something in this chapter that uh, that the theory and the practice has to be one. And uh, we have to reach back to these two, the roots of of these two. And uh, and this is how we find the Heideggerian Dasein. Mm-hmm. Actually, I, I don't want to go into it in details, but I honestly, I liked uh, what Dugin wrote here because it's an intellectual intellectual challenge to understand it. And that's why I, I, I liked what he what he like wrote here. And, and I also, suggest to read the, the book for everyone. Yes, I think uh, even if it's only to end up disagreeing with him, it's still worthwhile for people to read Dugan uh, because he's certainly one of the most radical thinkers. He's, he's very influenced by, you can't really understand Dugan without knowing something about the French New Right and Alain de Benoit, because mm-hmm. he sort of took the ideas of the French New Right and took them further and combined it with the Russian apocalyptic theological tradition and uh, mm-hmm. uh, Eurasianism and these other things and produced something new. But there's uh, there's still a lot of the New Right in him, but he's, he's even more radical than, than, than they are. <laughs> uh, mm-hmm. But it also, what you were saying, reminds me of something Avila wrote in one of his essays. I can't remember the name, but he was talking about, he was addressing Italians who were getting involved with the fascist party or, you know, uh, uh, joining the Italian military during World War II. And he said, uh, in some, I'm not quoting, of course, but the, the basically what he said was, yes, of course, Fascism is not traditional, but we can see how uh, it has the potential to become something yes, traditional. It can be a basis to to something even better. So it's yeah, yeah. So it's worth supporting for that reason. So he said, "There's no reason why uh, somebody who wants to be a man of tradition can't get involved in these activities as long as he doesn't become too attached to the actual outcome." So he didn't think that uh, a traditionalist who uh, gets involved with fascism should identify with the goals of fascism, but see it uh, not only as a way of uh, influencing society in a better direction, but using it as a way of uh, self-fulfillment. Uh, yeah. Because, of course, in war, uh, uh, a man has many opportunities uh, to uh, to develop himself. I mean, it's very dangerous, of course, but uh, and the same with political activity. Uh, you know, it is a form of duty, of course. So I think uh, it's something that, uh, as long as we don't get too caught up in the in party politics <laughs> yeah. in our own minds, uh, yeah, we can do this work. It's a form of dharma for us. I think we can say, yes. So practically, we can say that the fourth political uh, practice will be our duty, what we have to have to do from this spiritual aspect. Yes, I mean, Dugan in the book uh, states that the the fourth political theory is not an ideology yet, but he says it's a question. Uh, but we have to pose the right questions <laughs> to figure out what will be the thing that comes after liberalism. So, yeah, but we, we, I think in that sense, like you and I both have been involved in, uh, in politics in various ways. And uh, sure, it's not strictly traditional, but uh, you know, it's, it's part of doing our own duty. I mean, it's perfectly valid, I think, for, us, for a, somebody who wants to be a man of tradition 
to just uh, isolate himself from society and just focus on his spirituality mm -hmm. and, and, and study esotericism and so forth. But I don't think that's the only way for a yeah, traditional yeah, man to I agree. in this time. So people can argue on this point, but that's my own feeling. Okay, John, I think uh, we reached our end sentence. So thank you very much for for creating this podcast. I think oh, it was pleasure. very it was very interesting, and uh, we discussed a lot of things regarding Dugin. Do you remember something that, that uh, some point which we missed out? No, we. I mean. Well, one thing I did want to say too, just to critics of Dugin, yeah, is well, there's several things about critics of Dugin that I've noticed. The first is most of them never actually read him; uh, they only know about what they've heard from others, or maybe yeah. from like memes they've seen or <laughs> articles yeah. or whatever. They never actually study his work, so I would urge them to actually read what he says. Even then, they, they might not completely agree, but uh, they would see that he's a lot uh, more complex than they might think just from hearing uh, what people say about him online or whatever. Uh, yeah. But the other thing uh, I, would, I would say to his critics is that the way I see his work is that it has multiple levels and different aspects to it. And I think... Uh, even if you disagree with one aspect, that doesn't mean that therefore the rest of his ideas are invalid. Maybe like, for example, with me, uh, he uh, uses ideas about race from Franz Boas, uh, mm -hmm. you know, who is a big leftist. Uh, I disagree with this. I, I think about uh, race in a somewhat different way. I, I agree with Dugan that it shouldn't be the only important factor uh in in uh, politics and so forth but anyway so for me maybe even if i disagree with him there i can see uh aspects of his other other aspects of his work that are extremely valuable so uh yeah i would just urge people like a lot of his critics they find one uh phrase or paragraph or whatever from him or an idea that he expressed that they disagree with and like oh well i hate dugan now yeah, but, uh, yeah, he's he's too complex to be uh, dismissed so easily. Like there's a meme. I don't know if it's in Hungarian, but in English that's been going around for years that it's allegedly a quote from him where he's talking about uh, Zimbabwe. And he's saying, well, uh, uh, you know, I'm I'm completely with the, the blacks on this. Uh, the only reason why. Uh, uh, Russia is 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 saved, or I don't remember what word he uses. Saved is because we're not completely white, because of mm -hmm. course you know Russians are mixed with mm -hmm. Asiatic uh, influences as well. I don't even yeah. know for sure if he said that in this meme. It says it came from an interview he gave in mm -hmm. 2002. Uh, but even if he did, okay, yeah, I I might not. Uh, I mean, the issue of Zimbabwe is, is a little bit complicated since it was a, a colony. And in my view, the true right should be against colonialism. But uh, even if he did, OK, it's it's maybe I don't like that, but that doesn't mean that therefore everything else he ever said is invalid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. I would like so eventually, I don't know when I'll get time, but to write some texts trying to explain Dugan uh, and maybe language, it's a bit uh, simpler for, for people mm -hmm. to under, you know, the essential points of his ideology. Uh, he, there is a book that we published in Arctos called Eurasian Mission that is a good introduction, mm -hmm. but there's no Hungarian version of that as far as I know. Anyways, when, when you were in India, you met him in person. Yes, it was around the time we first started uh, working with him. He was speaking at a conference at the University of New Delhi. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, I was actually on my way to uh, attend a, a, the wedding of a, a sister of a friend of mine. <laughs> I see. I see. Uh, and so it was it was very convenient for me to stop there. Interestingly enough, the 
the subject of the conference was preparing for the post-American future. <laughs> but they had Dugan as one of the speakers there. Uh, yeah, as, as India is very interested in this concept of the multipolar world, of course. So uh, yeah. they've been very interested in having Dugan uh, uh, come there. Uh, so yes, I, I met him there and we spent a couple days together and, and talked. Uh, one of the most fascinating conversations of my life, actually. Uh, I think we wow. spoke for seven or eight hours nonstop about uh, every imaginable wow. topic. Wow. I, I mean, can he imagine. He has a lot of knowledge. I, can, <laughs> I, I like these kind of conversations. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I haven't seen him in person since then. I'm hoping one day I'll, I'll get to meet him again. But Hopefully. Yeah, I'm just, I, I don't know how this tragedy has affected him. Uh, uh, he, he started writing again. I've seen a few articles by him online, so it seems like he's not going to uh, yeah. unfortunate tragedy uh, frustrate him or, or scare him into stopping work. So uh, I hope that he'll still be uh, working for many years to come. Yes, yes. Okay, John, thank you very much for this for this conversation. That was an honor for me to to do this. Oh, my pleasure, my pleasure.